All right, it's noon, so I'm going to go ahead and get, uh, get us started by reading first the land acknowledgement statement. In honor of the Anishinaabe people, the original peoples and caretakers of this land, we would like to recognize that the University of Wisconsin Superior inhabits the lands of the Ojibwe people. Please take this moment to honor and celebrate ancestral Ojibwe land and the sacred lands of all indigenous peoples. Great. So welcome everyone to our OER authorship panel. We have several great panelists for you today and a few questions that we are going to ask them. Um, I'm going to get us started uh, by asking each of the panelists in turn to go ahead and introduce themselves. And then we will launch into some wonderful questions, get their opinions and viewpoints on OER authorship. So Lynn, would you like to start? Sure, I'm Lynn Gert, and I am faculty in the social work program uh, here on campus. How about Richard? Yeah, sure, you bet. My name is Rich Frazee. I'm an adjunct uh, online music instructor with uh, Superior, teaching through the independent learning program. And when I'm not doing that, I'm an instructional designer. So how about Stacy? Hi, everyone. My name is Stacy Gilpin. Um, I'm here in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, I always start like to start off with something a little bit about me as a person. Um, I am a proud parent now of a 12-week-old miniature schnauzer puppy. I did ask my husband to take um, Haida away out of our house right now so we wouldn't be interrupted. Um, but even um, something that's more exciting for me is I'm a UWS alum, and now I'm back teaching. I'm adjunct faculty in the graduate special education program. I'm working with the fabulous Amanda. Um, and I also was previously an OER fellow with the Hewitt um, Foundation, and I'm doing some um, work with Normandale Community College on their OERs they're creating for their teachers on a color grant. So um, I'm very passionate about OER work. And finally, Amanda. And I'm Amanda Zabaknik. I work in the Department of Education as an Associate Professor of Special Education and uh, have the honor of working with Stacy, as she mentioned, on um, creating, co-creating our uh, my what is my, will be my first OER. So very excited about this. Right. So we will be taking questions from the audience as well. If you're on YouTube Live and you would like to ask a question, please put that in the chat and we will get to your question um, as we do the predetermined questions. So please feel free to do that. So our first question for our lovely panel, what made you decide to author your own textbook for your class? I can hop in and take that. So um, being honest, uh, Stacy and I have collaborated on, you know, presentations in the past. And so um, she also has experience of, of teaching in the graduate special education um, course world. In particular, um, we were in communication as I oversee a lot of the uh, graduate special education related things. We were having a conversation about um, SPED 760 in particular, which is the behavior analysis and intervention course. And we, uh, Stacey just kind of mentioned, I wish we had a little bit, uh, you know, stronger text. It, it feels like it's maybe more clinical based in nature versus what um, our, our current, you know, teachers, teachers really need. And so um, that coupled with my uh, Wisconsin teaching scholars and fellows um, journey that I'm currently on, which is being really equity minded and, and uh, student focused. Um, OERs are a great way to um, be equitable um, in creating resources for all students. And so that's kind of where our journey began <laughs> and trying to find not only just a better uh, resource, but one that, that's free. That is a definite bonus. And I could just chime in now. Um, I agree 100% um, with everything that Amanda says. So I won't repeat any of it, um, but I wanted to share an example of kind of why Amanda and I, uh, just to illustrate more, went down the OER path is I have an email here I just received from a student. I'm getting feedback. It's towards the end of a term. And I had um, shared bits of the OER Amanda and I are working with, with some students that I'm teaching 7760 now, just because honestly, I was supplementing with such bits and pieces all over the place. I wanted to um, create sort of a document for them that was more organized. And so I've been working on it. So I thought, why not share this? 
And I had a student say, thank you for doing that. And they said, you know, just some feedback about the text, some more. She's like, I didn't even really open it. Um, and it was expensive. I think it's over, like over $100. And so she said, you know, I think she said, um, this is my kind of, uh, what is it, critique sandwich or criticism sandwich kind of thing. She said some good things. And then this, um, she said, but I'm glad that you're moving forward um, with an OER type text. Let me all add because my answer is very similar, um, but I... I hadn't used a text for years because I never found one that that I thought was accessible to students and way too expensive for what I thought would be the value from it. And so I have I had been creating content that I either would send to students before class or I would deliver it and take like a third of the class and then we would get to discussions and activities. And so I wanted to create material that they could review prior to class and then I could it would free up more of the time and it would be free for them and this particular class is cross listed with uh, uh, the public leadership and innovation major which is outside of social work and I didn't want a text that was just for social workers I wanted it to be inclusive of other majors and so I wanted to create content that was more inclusive. I'll, I'll jump in next. Um, so the online courses that I teach are generally um, general degree requirements. Um, they're not people pursuing music majors. It's not like this text is something that they're going to be referring to throughout the career. They're just looking for three credits and you know something of interest. So uh, beyond the money thing, um, a couple of uh, several years ago when I was working on the course, um, someone I was collaborating with suggested that um, we create some some study notes, basically highlighting key concepts of the texts. I enjoy content creation, and it kind of turned into like a like a hundred page summary of a like the two or three hundred page text. So I ended up creating this good chunk of of, of content. In addition to that, um, the text that I that I had been using it's it's, it's a fine text. Um, it also has like third party um, apps, so it has like quizzes and there's an online text. And I kept getting emails. Um, like I would say, ninety five percent of the emails that I was getting from students was from people who were having difficulty accessing accessing the online text or accessing the the supplemental materials. And it kind of got to a point where like, you know what, I could take all this time that I'm responding to these emails and I could just use that to just make an OER and just be done with uh, the, these barriers. And the timing was perfect. Um, but the time that I was looking at, I just, I had just joined the uh, superior um, staff as adjunct faculty. I just did a Google search about uh, OER grants in Wisconsin. And the first thing that came up was one of these uh, mini grant applications that was due in like a month. Like, well, let's let's give this a try. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be, and things aligned. Um, so, just real fortunate that that happened. Um, and also, there um, another big factor that's kind of been mentioning is just to highlight diversity. So, working um, especially in the world of music, especially like European influenced classical music. Your standard texts don't do a really good job um, including diverse populations, specifically people of color and women composers. And now don't get me wrong, I, I still have work to do with diversifying this content, but just going through like, yep, yeah, we are finding people who aren't just dead white males for each and every one of these units, just as a starting point is something that I'm, I'm very excited so that no matter what background a student comes from, I want to see them reflected in the material, even if it's like Renaissance music. Um, so just something I'm passionate about. Awesome. I That's really great. appreciate that being yesterday was International Women's Day. Thank you for including that. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, that's a great segue into our next question. What resources did you incorporate or consult in your creation of your OER? Should we go right back around the order? We sure <laughs> can. can. Sure. Um, so documents such as current syllabus, um, and then for all education programs, making sure there are specific assessment pieces required by Wisconsin's wonderful Department of Public Instruction that absolutely have to be included. 
um, continue to be included in the courses. So looking for materials that um, can assist in those type of assessments. Um, and then through, like I said, Wisconsin Teaching Fellows, they, they uh, offer a budgeting and supplies <laughs> thing that you can use to purchase um, like supplies. So um, I did a lot of searching of different um, little texts related to behavioral analysis. So um, functional behavioral assessment was a, a little book I got, equity inclusion in education case studies, um, techniques for managing verbally and physically aggressive students, functional curriculum for elementary and secondary students with special needs. And so those are some of the um, other texts that looked um, like it really aligned with the curriculum um, needs of the course. And so it just came down to taking pieces, the most applicable pieces out of those um, hard copy resources, and then also looking for applicable um, videos or supplemental other um, things as well to include in the OER. And we're we're about halfway through this process. So we're our, our goal is because geo programs operate on a seven week schedule. So after talking with Stacy, we're like, well, let's just create a seven <laughs> um, uh, seven chapter OER. And so that's kind of the logic we um, used in create in in the process of creating them. And one more thing I want to add to um, what Amanda shared was I've done some work um, with OER and authoring and things, and I had some have some resources um, that are open access textbooks um, that have licenses on them. I don't want to get into a lot about licensing, but the authors licensed them, which is a really cool thing about OER, so that they could be remixed and reshared as long as I give them credit, Amanda and I give them credit within our text. And so that's something that's been really cool because I had found, of course, lots and bits of pieces of some of these open access texts that I wanted to use, but I didn't like all of them. So we've been able to pull parts. And the nice thing is like copy and paste chunks with author's permission into our text and give them credit. Um, and so that's been a really, um, a really fun thing to do. And I really suggest if you're going to get into the OER kind of author authoring world, um, to really consider um, doing some of that. So I accessed one open source textbook that was available. I, I scanned a lot of material, but I only found one that I had actually known about before. And I incorporated that, of course, complying with all of their copyright um, um, expectations. And then the rest of the content I ended up creating, which was never my intention, but that's what I found myself doing. <laughs> and then, of course, pulling from a ton of references. I, like Amanda, I ordered a, just a whole bunch of books and I did this project mostly when I was on sabbatical and I just read and read and read. And so I incorporated a lot of information as like, you know, references and things like that, but but it was like content that I, I put it together. I'll jump in then. Um, so I mentioned I had the past uh, study notes, kind of like my own summary of, of the old text. In addition to that, I went through and found um, the lecture transcripts for um, instructional videos that I had made to as, as, um, for content. And also echoing uh, other ideas, I, I remixed other existing sources. Um, the University of Georgia system had a, had a, a, a text was good information. Um, I wanted to rearrange how a lot of the content was, and there was a lot of pick and choosing of, I like this and I like that. Um, and there were other sources that I saw that you could remix. Um, for anyone who is excited about pursuing this, um, just to learn from what I ended up doing, make sure you're keeping really good track and really diving into the specifics of how they want the material. I, we discovered in the process that there were a couple of sources that they do let you remix, um, you know, incorporate and adapt as you see fit. But they also like and make sure that you include a link to our OER like on every page that you're remixing. It's like, well, that sounds 
really cumbersome. And so I paraphrased, you know, the, the portions that I, that I liked and then credit it. Um, I, I moved that from the portions that I copy and pasted and then just made that part of the bibliography. So adapting other materials and of course, just being really respectful of what, um, you know, that what the creators have said about how they want their material presented. Something I learned in this process, YouTube has a filter where you can search for what's been uploaded with Creative Commons licensing. And so my initial thought was, you know, I teach music, I'll include YouTube links or say, you know, these are pretty famous pieces. You'll be able to find Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or this Beatles song on YouTube. And the, but after um, learning about the filters, I was able to include a downloadable listening list with, I don't know, 80, 90 music examples that had just been been shared by YouTube. And that also kind of inspired me since I was already finding stuff on YouTube. I would sometimes find things that I, I really liked, but they hadn't attached that Creative Commons license, which that's that's their property. They're, they're fun, that's fine. But I just emailed them and be like, hey, I'm, I'm making this textbook. Um, and there's something about asking people, you know, I would love to use this thing in my course. My students would love to see this access. Would would you be willing to share this? And um, generally, they're they're pretty. When when you frame it uh, like that, they're nobody said no. Everybody was just honored. Like, my yes, but yeah, that'd be wonderful. Please use that. That's that's great. That's great. And then the last thing. Um, so what I love about OER is that it can be a living document. I am I'm I'm catching typos. I'm revising as needed. I'm also crafting into my course um, as a, a midterm and a final assessment, students getting to write about whatever they want. And I'm including as an optional thing, do you give permission for us to take what you've written and add to this resource? And again, making this clear, you don't have to do this. This is your writing, do whatever we want with your writing. But for future iterations, students in the course will be helping shape what this text looks like. So really, really excited about that. That is very exciting. And also another great segue talking about the frustration of, you know, trying to figure out how to cite things sometimes because the authors want things. What did you find most frustrating about this process and how did you overcome that? You want to go, Amanda? Should we just keep the order since we're kind of half and half? I wouldn't call it super frustrating. I guess I mean um, more questions as this is the first time going through this process. I think I just had questions. Um, my mind goes to how to make this um, OER something that students um, can easily access within the course shell too, to a variety of different learners. So Stacy and I have had conversations about, you know, not including charts or like being able to consider universal design for learning. And, you know, with all these great resources, we have bits of um, text and stuff, but how much is too much? And at what point do we need to to put in, you know, put something else in there, a, a supportive video. And so just, um, I wouldn't say frustration so much, but just a lot of back and forth, just open conversations about, okay, we, we have two full pages of pretty intense information here. Do we need to break it up right now? And with what? So not frustrations, um, just, just questions, I guess, here and there. <laughs> Opening the door for more collaboration. And to add to what um, Amanda shared, I would say um, some, some advice that I think would help alleviate a frustration that I found helpful was looking at other examples of OER texts out there in your field and paying special attention to like the writing craft, not only the content, but how are they giving credit um, to the, you know, those that have come before them? How are they citing remix materials? How are they doing their bibliog bibliography and things like that? And I would say that through that process, Amanda and I have kind of picked and chose kind of what we liked and made it our own. Um, but I think looking at models really helped a lot. Yeah. Yes, that really helped with the formatting, just the layout of the entire document. Yeah. Because once you get that going, because I, I do think that initially kind of that, how are you going to keep track and reference all this information? But once you kind of get a system down, um, it goes really fast. For me, um, I'm kind of 
in the thick of the frustration, <laughs> like the frustrating part, because because I think it could feel like it's a never ending thing and it's not ready to be shared publicly yet. But I feel like I could always think that. And at some point, it's just like it. I just need to put it out there and get feedback. And so I'm going to a conference at the end of March where it will be not necessarily public, but I'll talk about it publicly. And um, but there's things about the the platform that I'm using that are just really frustrating because it's the um, if I create a you know if I create a table and upload it as a JPEG, it's not accessible. The con you know the content reader would not work, and so then I try to use the table uh, within the platform, and it never looks right. And so things like that, I'm trying to use tools, and I've ended up hiring somebody to figure out some of this stuff because I don't have time. So so that's I'm limited by my own capacity, but I'm I'm not willing to share it until I till it's better. Thanks for bringing up something that I think Lynn, once we're closer to the end of our OER, that that point of just gotta be done, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. at some point. And um, I'll also maybe think of it, it this is a very time, uh, time consuming process, at least for me and, and finding, chunking out time in my schedule, I guess is, is one, a big challenge too. I just, I do it, but it, it is um, time intensive. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with it. The time intensive. And for me, the toughest part was getting started. Mm -hmm. Like any, once I, I got my, my first paragraphs in my first chapter, like then, then I got on a roll, but like, oh my goodness, like this, this is it. And and then the next part was getting, um, I, I included various images. Um, but again, there's a host of stuff shared um, that's freely accessible to, to, to share. And it's like, okay, well now it's time to add my pictures and what's this gonna look like? And, you know, after the first couple, like, okay, I'm on a roll. And then it was the glossary, like, oh, I gotta make a glossary. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's kind of like that first like couple, you know, let's say the first hour of whatever new task I was doing, just getting in that role. Um, knowing when to stop um and because there's it's 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 not that traditional text that's you know locked in stone if you will um it's you can always go back and i mm -hmm. i think for me i've i've had various milestones um whether it's the course is about to launch it's like okay course launched i'm taking a break from this um this panel was another one of those like oh yeah i'm like I, I get to geek out about my OER leading up to that. Let's let's spend just a little bit of time doing some tweaks here and there, um, and, but also knowing like, yep, and, and it's fine, and I can go back to it. Um, something that I've has helped me because um, I, I I know there there's got to be time more typos in there. I just put an announcement to my students. Um, hey, I'm really excited that you have a free text. There might be some typos. If you want extra credit, let me know when you see them and you will get extra credit. So just being upfront mm -hmm. with the students too, um, just to know like, yep, it's not the most polished thing in the world, but it's free and you can increase your grade if you see something. So I will just say I did the exact same thing after every section because I actually I used it in class this fall. I think you did too, Richard. Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and after every section, I had this survey, and it was basically like whatever feedback you give me, you get the same points. You know, that wasn't based obviously on their their quality, the type of feedback. But one of the questions was, what you know, just what's something that needs to be fixed? And and so I have this long list. But it was great. Like, it, and you just have to be, even to go down this road, you got to be humble. You got to be open to feedback. Otherwise, this isn't, this isn't the, you know, this isn't what you'd want to pursue. But I sure feel, I feel really good about the OER jerk path that I've selected. Like, I wouldn't change that for anything. It feels like it's aligned with my ethics and, um, but, but I have to be really open to grammar and editing and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, which is fine, which is fine, you know. Well, and that's a great segue into the question, what did you learn about yourself and your teaching as a result of pursuing this project?
for asking the hard hitting questions today. Yeah, yes. The thing that came to mind just right away is that we want this to be um, a source that our future or current teachers can apply immediately in the classrooms that they are serving in. And so, you know, while there are <laughs> certain I's that need to be dotted and T's that need to be crossed in terms of uh, Wisconsin DPI requirements and assessments. We also want this to be something that students want to go back to and reference and, and use um, for a variety of situations that they will face um, on a daily or weekly basis in the classrooms that they're in. Yeah, I think that that was the that was the key thing is we wanted something that a text for our teachers or practicing teachers that they could um, use that had lots of resources and links and things like that. Because I found within my teaching, like that's where I go right away. I was a practitioner in a classroom. I'm very practical. But when I was trying to communicate that through my teaching to my students, it became really cluttered. Like I had students say, I love all the resources, but can you like put them in one place or do this or that? And I thought, I am, <laughs> you know, in my, in my head, but then since like, obviously I wasn't. Um, so it's been, I think, just organizing things for students and um, in a way that's more like accessible for them. And it might not be like what is accessible for me coming from my kind of instructor side, but I think taking that feedback and now, hey, we have the opportunity to like share this out with students and get their feedback again about the organization and things and we can control it. Um, so I think just like being humble, being open to, to the feedback and um, just that's part of teaching. Yeah, I will say that the, one of the things that I, well, a couple of things. One is I, I can still do hard things, <laughs> you know, because when I first started this, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Like, honestly, it felt too big. Um, but I was, I just broke it into pieces and just organ got organized and just jumped in and just started working on it. But one of the things that I have absolutely like loved about this is it gave me a, a reason to learn new things because I realized I wanted the, the what I was creating to bring in con contemporary things that in traditionally published material was contemporary five years before it comes onto the shelf. Um, and so I like, I learned all of these new things because I wanted to, and then I built it in and I had to understand it enough to write about it, which then got me to the point to where I could teach it. And, and professionally, I just happened to also be working on a consulting project that allowed me to try these things that I was learning. So it, it that wasn't intended, but it, it was, it just reminded me how much I like to learn new things and that I can do that in this kind of a platform. It's built, you know, it just, it felt like it was kind of built in and, and there's a lot of incentive to, to learn new things and be very contemporary, at, at least in my field, at least the, what I was writing about. Yes, um, Lynn, I think that's like a hundred percent true because you're always finding these resources um, you know, as an instructor and things, but it's like, where do you put them? Like, where mm -hmm. do you organize them? Like, what note pile do they go in? And I think it's nice to be able to like have a document. Oh, when I revise my OER, I'm going to put this in that time and um, it's just done. Yeah, just that that love of learning, especially I've been teaching this course for a while and um, there are a lot of the big names keep popping up. And again, like Beethoven's really important. You, you can't teach like a, a history of European classical music without him. But um, I think really, as I mentioned with trying to diversify the, the course material, you know, one, it's it's awesome living in an age where I can just Google like women Renaissance composers or Renaissance uh, black composers and stuff pops up. And then YouTube links will pop up. And um, I, I also going back to like in the older stuff, even just like community, like, you know, somebody's like, we don't know a ton about this person, but here's what we know. And I think just like communicating that too with students, like we don't know a ton, but like here's what we have. And this is pretty cool that this person who may not be a household name, like 
their stuff still survived like 800 years like how awesome is that and um I also found that for for me, and every you know every context is different, but I I love um, to, um, kind of creating assignments and projects where where students are going on their own ventures and doing their own research, and that for me at least with this project kind of helped take some of the pressure off. Like it's okay if I don't have the extensive list of all the most important things about this composer because I've created an assignment where like, okay, now is the opportunity where you get to, you, you sampled what's in the text. Now you go off and like, see what excited you. And like, you go and like research and find out all, all those things and we'll all learn together. So just that collaboration, good stuff. Awesome. Well, that, that isn't the same, the, the best the level of um, segue that we've seen before, but the next question. <laughs> What differences do you see in using a self-authored text and a standard text? Well, one thing that comes to mind is just with the open educational resource framework, I mean, when you get to know your students, you, you might come across a resource that you know would really help um, a particular student or students um, in their teaching practice. And so being able to type, <laughs> go actively in and, and type that kind of information in or find extra resources to support the student, for me, I feel that is um, a way better method versus the, um, you, can't, you can't go back through the publisher, your hard, hard copy of the textbook and say, hey, I wanna add one paragraph here create a new edition. Well, I suppose you could, <laughs> but it it just, it takes a lot of time, um, more so with the traditional textbook approach and going through a lot of different layers there versus um, how quickly you can make accommodations in an OER. And I'll be honest, to piggyback off of that, I was kind of tired of um, having a text that like I didn't even want to read and students would comment on things. And I'd be like, I don't even know where that is because like it wasn't like I was like, I moved past that, like, you know, kind of speaking to what Amanda says. So it's just nice to have a text that like I don't want to I, that I kind of filtered everything through and designed it. Um, to meet the needs, like Amanda said, of our students and not taking this kind of prepackaged curriculum kind of thing and then saying, read this page, but don't worry about this page and that, trying to, you know, make it better fit our students, just being done with all of that. As someone who has co-authored a hard copy text and now I'm co-authoring an OER, I just like the responsiveness of an OER more. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think... <laughs> For the for the class that I've designed mine for, um, I, I know I mentioned this, but it's it's intended to go beyond the audience of social work. And so I'm like, you know, I got to take social work out of it and put in like change makers. That's kind of the phrase. And then I described like what, you know, what are all the professions that should engage in community and organizational change in order to fulfill the mission of their profession? You know, so it just feels like. It's, you know, it, it's like you could just kind of spread that it's like the tentacles, you know, and, and I'm excited about the idea that like maybe some nursing faculty would take like a, a part of it. And, you know, there's so many other disciplines, but the textbooks typically are written for your discipline by your discipline. And so, you know, I'm just a very interdisciplinary person by nature. And I think what I teach is interdisciplinary, but the boundaries have been established by out, you know, external forces. So this just kind of feels like the <laughs> doing what, you know, doing what fits the way that I teach and the way that I think the content should be delivered. And it just, and, and accessible to professions outside of social work, which just feels, I don't know, it just feels like the, like it just fits. And I think it will be more helpful than if I would have done it just in my discipline. I really resonated with Stacy's comment about traditional publishers of just being done with all that. I think of um, again the, the texts I've used they're 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 fine. 
Um, but I, I remember one of them. So I, I, I love video game music. And um, there was one, my, my, my most recent text, um, it was talking about the Super Mario Brothers theme. And instead of listing the, the end, the composer, the, the music was created by this guy. It's like, no, that's the person who made the game. That's not the person who made the music. It's like, and we're charging our students. Like, and, and again, th this is such a, like a little thing in the whole scheme of music history. But like, and my students are paying like over a hundred bucks for this. And um, for the me to like have to like go in and like clean it up or like make a comment or uh, even just like reorganizing course material. Like, you know what? You've put this composer like in this like era and, and eras are nebulous and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like I actually like talking about it like in this context and rather than like messing with the 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 readings like now make sure that um this half of chapter 19 don't read that yet we're gonna get to it next time which inevitably just like leads to confusion and i'm done with it because i just rearrange it however i want to and it's awesome awesome so that's a that's a fun segue into our what did you find the most rewarding about this experience and why So I, I love the collaboration piece. Uh, I think ultimately at the end, the most rewarding will be that final, well, never final, but once we press the, uh, at this point, our OER is going to be the, what is used in fall uh, SPED 760. And then I look forward hopefully to positive and, you know, and or some constructive comments from students as well about the OER in itself. Yeah, I would uh, second Amanda again. We collaborate together well, which probably also makes um, that the, the most rewarding part. But um, I just love um, partnering with Amanda and we both bring different perspectives in. And like, I feel like it's also like professional development for me as an instructor doing this process. It's that kind of growth and things. And then to have a product at the end um, and like something that we're working towards um, is even better. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'm very proud of what, what I've done. And I, like I said, I used it in the class and the feedback was really, I mean, it was really positive, even though there were lots of things that needed to be fixed, which I knew that there would be, but, but the students were like, you know, I've never had such an accessible textbook. I really like the style. I intentionally designed each section. So it was like no more than like five or six pages. Um, and I did the whole thing that way. And, and the students were like, I've never read a book where you could look at, you know, it's in sections, even if I said read two sections, you know, so, so it felt like what I, what I planned seemed to be valuable. So that was really rewarding. Um, um, but also just what I learned and what I've, how I've evolved as a professional has been, I never would have anticipated what, where I would be now. Um, just all the things that I learned and that I've already incorporated it in multiple aspects of my professional world, which is amazing. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so many things that I'm, I really, I'm, I, I'm really happy how students are going to benefit from this text. I'm, but I think what's most rewarding has been my own just like knowledge and learning. Like I learned a lot about a lot of great pieces of music that. I only learn more about because like, well, I'm writing this OER. Let's see, well, you know, let's branch out from all the, you know, all the other same composers I've been learning about. And at the same point, I, I already mentioned learning about the Creative Commons search uh, filter in YouTube. Like I've, I've loved geeking out on content creation and making use of what's freely accessible. And like, that's something I'm gonna be using for a while. Um, I, I made this in, uh, now in the whole scheme of platforms, kind of low tech, but like I, I made a Google Doc. Um, but I learned I, I've been using Google Docs for like a decade, and I learned like all sorts of like new tips and tricks with Google Docs um, that I didn't know and picked up because I wrote like a 280 page OER. So just the new little features and things along that way. So yeah, very very appreciative of the personal growth. Great. Well, <clears throat> our lovely panel, what would you say to someone who is insecure about authoring their own OER? I'll 
not to throw off the order, but I'll jump in if that's okay. <laughs> I I I think that's healthy. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th this is daunting. I mean, this is a, a and I, I think and I think it's okay to acknowledge um, that you know knowing where to start, knowing what platforms to use. Um, I, I just kind of embrace the the uncertainty of I don't I don't know exactly what I'm going to get myself into, but um, you know I'll, I'll just give a, a shout out for the um, superior staff that uh, was part of the mini grant project. Those folks are amazing. So if you have for anyone listening who has a chance to apply for a mini grant, you'll get to work with really, really, really awesome people, and you'll learn some great things. So I just want to give that that shout out. Um, and I, I think just to, you, you look at that published text, especially like an intimidating hardcover. Um, and, I, and I think like, yes, you know, that, that, that text is the final product, but, you know, just know how to like parse it out and let it, I mean, I, I had goals of doing this for like five or six years before I finally, finally did it. So if you're in a situation where you can't do it this semester and or even next semester and you just want to like jot down your ideas and then like, okay, this, this is the semester that I have the bandwidth. Here's my bajillions of notes that I've been just adding little by little, a bit by bit. That's okay. And if you want, and I, I think a healthy approach too is looking at an OER piecemeal. For example, maybe, I mean, yes, you can have a finished text. What if you start with, okay, I'm going to use, I'm going to use my text for like two more semesters, but I'm finding a couple articles that I think could like, oh yeah. I don't need to do this chapter anymore because I have this article. And then little by little, and you, you do your own writing to connect the dots. And with enough time and scaffolding, you have your own OER. So just just some thoughts there. Since we're going I, out of order, I'll jump yeah, in. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, I agree with Richard. That's kind of what Amanda and I have been doing over the past year, because this spring, when I got to teaching 760, I was like, oh, we need to do these crisis management plans. Oh, before I had like all these like hodgepodge of things, but now I've got this little document here that this chapter that I'm going to share with students. And so just things like that as part of, you know, launching next year will kind of be finished. I would say also um, the mini grant um, staff at UWS could not be any more helpful in kind of meeting you wherever you're at and supporting your needs. Um, I'm not going to be able to say the name of the workshop correctly, but I went to one last August that the, the most a lot of the mini grant staff were there about OER, and it was just kind of a general one, um, a good overview, but that was super helpful. Um, I've gone to open ed, and I think that um, UWS supported um, some people to go to that last year funding, but it's a great community. Um, you get to hear about people doing this work and get ideas. I think there's a stout has a has a yeah, conference. Um, so just I think even going to you know a workshop and learning about it because honestly I had been learning about um, this kind of stuff for two or three years before I actually was like okay now I'm going to do it. I've been doing some things with open pedagogy, which is a whole nother thing. But I was like oh I can do like little lessons where I start to have students curate materials, but I don't know if I'm ready to take the step myself to curate them for students and with them. Um, so it's kind of like, I feel like a progression. I totally agree with everything that you all said. So the only thing I have to add is if it, if you can combine something big with this, you know, have that be the sabbatical project. I honestly thought it was, it was fabulous to be able to have that kind of time. I'm not sure how I would be able to do this, which I, I know that was like a luxury, but, but um, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did if I wasn't sabbatical. It's just like that, that just makes sense. But it was really nice because then I was able to like dive in and I had planned it and, and all of that. Yeah. I echo everything that has been said. And I think it's, um, it is absolutely all right to be asking questions like, do I have the time to do this? What sort of resources are there? And so just have that curiosity and know that you feel free to talk to any of us in this group. Feel free to connect with Click. Um, 
go to different OER workshops if you're curious. Um, and then this is the disability uh, advocacy or student advocacy heart in me. Just think about how you know possible creation of this OER could really help a ton of students that you work with in your courses. Um, I'm probably not alone in this, but I've had in past classes students reach out and say, I can't buy my textbook yet because I have have to pay my mortgage or rent, um, those sorts of things. So just the, the sheer power behind like statements like that, um, starting this process, you will make a difference in students' lives. Awesome. Well, we have about five minutes left. Are there any questions from the audience or our audience on YouTube Live? Could you talk about the publishing process, what that's like? Here. Thanks. Maybe I'll jump into that one. Um, I haven't got, I mean, like I'm close to that point, but I, um, I'm i using Pressworks. And so I've been building it in Pressworks and I'm going to, to have it be like, an, uh, um, I've been exporting it as a PDF for students, but then my plan is for it to be um, like an E, you know, like an E book. Um, and then like publishing for me is basically letting letting people know and then um, inviting that that peer review. <clears throat> so for me, I it won't quite be ready uh, when I, I'm going to a conference at the end of March, but I'm going to be talking about it and and like getting, you know, asking who's interested. And then publishing will really be making it, releasing it in a public format. And and in in the in social work, um, there is an open source. Like there's one person who is keeping tabs of what's happening with OERs and social work, and he's got this this list serve. And so he's planning to like let people, you know, to announce it and then invite peer review. So that's what that's what the, my process will be like. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's one nice piece about collaborating. We are <laughs> helping each other with the, the editing pieces throughout this. Um, and Lynn, it's really good to hear because uh, I think we're all at different process spots in our OER you know, journey here. So the actual publishing of what I envision and Stacy, we want to incorporate whatever that document, uh, living document looks like into SPED 760 in the fall. That's ultimately the publishing element. And so at this point, Amanda and I had talked um, about, um, we're all about like accessibility and things, having a PDF version, um, possibly a Google Doc version, a Word version, um, and linking it right out of, right out of our course. Um, like short term and like getting feedback from students. And then eventually, I think we kind of have bigger plans that we'd like. There's a, a repository out of the University of Minnesota. Um, they have a lot of great OER there. Um, uh, having some sort of landing place like that, because part of doing the OER work is us using others' work, but then you kind of give back by then letting other people use your work. And so I think finding a platform um, so it's accessible to others in the field. Yeah, um, as far as publishing, this sounds like, you know, duct tapes and rubber bands, but for a while, I'm gonna have my Google Doc link. <laughs> Here, here's the link. Here's the directions as to how you can save it as a PDF for your own computer. Um, but I'm I'm good with that for a while. This um, and part of it is, you know, just the pacing. I put a lot of time into this, and for now, that's that's going to work. Um, I'm sharing it with um, like my undergrad degree. Uh, I, I share like, hey, if you're looking for something, here's something that one of your alums has been up to, and I'll I'll share it with like my my my. my uh, people I know in the music world, eventually, um, like maybe in five, ten-ish years, when I'm pretty sure all the typos are out of there, I'll um, you know look at those repository things that exist for OER. Um, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not not in a rush. Any other questions? Right. If not, we're just about at time. I want to thank our lovely panelists. This was super informative and just a really great experience. 
Uh, this has been recorded and will be available shortly on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, the Jim Denhill Library YouTube channel. So I will send that out to the panelists. And if anybody wants that link, just grab it and send it out. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.